Thank you. So this is past my bedtime, so I don't know about all of you, but I'm feeling um, a little bit sleepy. So I'm going to try and make this um, something that will wake us up a little bit and uh, keep it short as well. And it's about one of my favourite topics. So I work a lot on gas. It's true, I love gases. Uh, but I really like one particular gas and the other forms it takes, which is nitrogen. And for me, it's, it's wonder stuff. It's, um, it's something which, as I hope I'm going to prove to you, is fundamental in terms of all of our lives, but also in terms of the global challenges we face in the 21st century. And it begin, begins, for me, nitrogen with high school chemistry class. Remember that class when you had to do the periodic table? And it was, for me, I guess the next slide kind of sums up how I felt about it. <laughs> I had a good teacher. So we had Mr. Davies, and he was, he was very enthusiastic, and he wanted to take us through the periodic table uh, in a way where we'd remember it. And we did hydrogen, and hydrogen was pretty good. We had a, a test tube with hydrogen in, and we put a match in, and it went pop. So we kind of remembered that. And then the week after, we had helium. Now, helium was the best. It was the only one I really remembered. Because he brought in balloons, which was OK. But the bad boys at the back worked out that if you breathed in the helium, you got a really high voice. And that really kind of cemented in my mind that helium was the most exciting element. <laughs> then we got to nitrogen. And you could see the pain on Mr. Davies' face. Because we had had practicals, we had demonstrations for the other elements, but nitrogen, well, he said, nitrogen's really common. If you take a breath in now, then 78% of that air that you're taking in is nitrogen. Uh, so remember that, he said. So we went to the exam at the end of the year, and we regurgitated what we knew about squeaky voices and helium, but also that nitrogen was a very common part of the atmosphere. And I think for most of us, we were glad to then forget about nitrogen. But for me, it wouldn't go away. And it came back, I guess, from university onwards, that this stuff was actually much more interesting than Mr. Davies had let on. I found out that it was part of all of us. It was part of our DNA. It was part of all life on Earth, re relying on nitrogen. And actually, one of the, the most... The window started to open for me. The most memorable window on nitrogen was the, was the next slide, which was at University Sub-Aqua Club. So we all went along there as novice divers and listened to the, the kind of the grizzled, experienced divers. And they told us about this thing called being narked. This thing which is nitrogen narcosis, where as you get deeper in the water, you absorb more of the nitrogen gas and you get high. Now, as you can see, that can be quite dangerous because there have been divers who worry about the fish drowning and so give the fish their air, which is, you know, obviously quite bad news for them. <laughs> We were all really keen to experience this, this narked uh, experience. And thankfully, our instructors didn't let us go straight into the water and do deep dives. But what they did do for us is set up a visit to a, a recompression chamber. And there, for people like this, who've gone down to depth, they've absorbed lots of nitrogen gas, but then they've come up too fast. And what happens then is you get bubbles of nitrogen in your bloodstream, which cause the bends, this debilitating condition. So these compression units are for people like him to go in and so go back under pressure and hopefully dissolve the nitrogen. So we went to this, a whole group of us from all over the world, these trainee divers, and we went into this chamber in the um, northwest of England where we were studying. And we were in shorts and a T-shirt. There's a party atmosphere, and we started to go deeper. And it was fantastic. I can recommend it in terms of being not. So not only did we all feel fairly high, but everyone took on a high-pitched Mancunian accent. It was, it was surreal. And I've looked in the literature, the medical literature, is that I couldn't find a reason, but it, it really happened. But that was the window opening for me as nitrogen being actually something which was interesting and important. And like I say, is the more I worked on it and found out about it, the more I realized that actually it was fundamental to our life on Earth. Do you want to go to the next slide? So one of the key facts I found out fairly early on is that we as a society have really str struggled with saying the world struggled and also with getting enough reactive nitrogen. So in terms of the, um, the early 20th century, the world population was growing fast. We needed more food and reactive nitrogen, the kind of fertilizers we put on the field, was one of the main limitations for that. And a, a great scientist, a controversial scientist called Fritz Haber, 
came up with a way of taking all that nitrogen that we're breathing in now, which is unreactive in the air, and making it a reactive form. And if we look at our population in here today and around the world, about two out of five of every one of us owe our existence to that invention and to our ability to fix reactive nitrogen from the atmosphere. Now, if we think about the future, we think about the 21st century and the challenges that we face in terms of food security, climate change, water, air pollution. Nitrogen is, is fundamental to them. If we go to the next slide and take... Click again. Take a scenario where we need to feed 9 or 10 billion people by 2050. That reactive nitrogen, those fertilisers, they're going to decide whether we win or whether we lose in terms of that battle for food security. They can be great saviours, but they also can be a real danger. There's a real double-edged sword which emerged for me the more I worked on nitrogen. In that if we put it in the wrong place at the wrong time, it can be a real source of extra greenhouse gas emissions, so drive more climate change. It can cause additional air quality issues, so air pollution. And it can also, if we put nitrogen on these fields at the wrong time, escape into the water and cause water pollution and algal blooms. Now, I couldn't, in this talk, leave out my favourite example of nitrogen pollution. Do you want to go to the next slide? So, this you'll recognise probably as Hugh Laurie or House. Now, House is a, a medical drama series which was on a few years ago. Hopefully, you all know it. But if you haven't seen it, the, the rough plot for House was that um, each week you had some, um, something go wrong. He was a doctor. He had a team of doctors. And at the beginning of each week, there would be an odd case, a really difficult case, that House and his team had to crack in terms of what was wrong with the patient. And nitrogen is one of those things where once it escapes from fields, it kind of goes, there's a cascade through the system, a bit like the butterfly effect in terms of nitrogen going in and out of soils and water. And one of the things we find with the water we drink is it has to be carefully controlled. Because if we have too much reactive nitrogen going into our body, we run a risk of a thing called blue baby syndrome. Now, blue baby syndrome would have been great for house. Because, to start off with the episode, you'd have someone turning blue. And this is quite a rare condition, thankfully. It's all about the nitrogen binding with your, your uh, blood, so stopping it being able to carry oxygen. And it's usually in babies, and it's, 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 it's really around private wells now rather than the public water systems. But one of the most recent cases, which should definitely be an episode, was a grown woman rushed into hospital in the US, and she was turning blue. And the doctors, you know, were really worried. Her condition was deteriorating. And then one of them recognised, well, it's a grown-up, but this could be blue baby syndrome. They gave her the treatment for it, and she started to recover. And then they asked her, OK, you know, what have you been doing in terms of uh, what brought you to us in, in this state? And uh, she, she went through what she'd been doing in terms of the previous night. She'd had a meal. She'd drunk lots of water. So they did the kind of house thing. They went to her house. They tested the, the food she'd been eating. They tested the water, and there was no nitrate there. It's just like a house episode. that They thought they had the result, but that wasn't the answer. And then they went back to her and said, OK, um, just like he would do, just like house would do, what have you been doing for the whole week? Tell us a bit more about what you've been up to. And it turned out this woman was a keen runner. And about a week before, she had a bit of a muscle strain. She went to her local doctor, and he gave her a cold pack. And again, the doctors uh, in this case, certainly in House's episode, they wouldn't know, well, what's the relevance there? And House would have said, look in the icebox. Because what they did was talk to this woman a bit more about what she did with that cold pack. And she said, oh, I kept it, and I put it in the icebox. Nice sound. They went to her house again, just like he would have instructed. They opened up the icebox. There was the cold pack, and the cold pack had split open. And the cold pack was made of concentrated ammonium nitrate. And when she went down in that night before to have a drink of water after her hot meal, she had had a big concentrated drink of ammonium nitrate, a fertilizer, and given herself blue baby syndrome. I think, if you're listening, Hugh Laurie, come back for a special here in Edinburgh. We'll do the thing. We'll do blue baby syndrome. It would be a great episode. So in terms of that double-edged sword, that's an example of where reactive nitrogen in the wrong place at the wrong time can be a real problem. And like I say, it's a driver of climate change in the wrong place at the, at the wrong time. Same in terms of acidification and air pollution. 
But if we go to the next slide, yes, it's a double-edged sword. But if we use it in the right way, so we use it in terms of precision agriculture, making sure that we do grow our crops, crops more effectively, that we have equity of access to this really valuable resource, then we can actually help tackle food security, help feed those 9, 10 billion people by the middle of the century, reduce air, air pollution, reduce water pollution. I think, for me, nitrogen is a wonder stuff. Thank you.